Hello, I'm Dr. J. Randall Curtis. I'm director of the Cambia Palliative Care Center of Excellence at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about how we can improve interprofessional communication in the intensive care unit. I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. I do like to acknowledge our funding sources, including our healthcare system, UW Medicine, the Cambia Health Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and also PCORI. What I'll talk about during this talk is the role of interprofessional communication in the ICU. Uh, I'll talk about the results of two randomized controlled trials of interprofessional interventions, particularly around uh, enhancing communication. Uh, and then finally, uh, lessons from regional variability in interprofessional communication. Interprofessional collaboration and communication in the intensive care unit, particularly with between doctors, nurses, and the other uh, specialists who work in the ICU, has been associated with decreased ICU mortality, decreased ICU length of stay and readmission rates. It's also been associated with decreased physician and nurse conflict and decreased job stress for nurses. So this is an important area to focus on to include patient outcomes as well as the interpro interprofessional environment in the intensive care unit. We developed this model of interprofessional shared decision-making in the ICU through a mixed method study in which we did observations and interviews in several ICUs in our hospital system. Um, and we argued that there were really four levels of decision-making, individual decision-making that doctors and nurses do all the time. There's um, information exchange, where one professional gives another professional information and that other professional makes a decision. There's deliberation, where there's two-way interaction and discussion, but ultimately a decision is made by one individual. And then there's shared decisions, uh, where we bring a consensus together. And we argue in this piece that all of these levels are important, but for particularly important and difficult decisions, shared decision-making can improve decisions uh, as well as outcomes. This is a study from uh, uh, Professor Bernard and his group uh, in, uh, in Brussels. Um, and what they did was did a, um, a uh, survey of a lot of different intensivists and uh, ICU nurses uh, and identified seven domains of ethical decision-making climate. Uh, and I think that this is an important piece because it really helps us understand better um, the, the ethical decision-making climate. One of these domains is self-reflective and empowering leadership by physicians. Another domain is practice and climate of open and interdisciplinary reflection. And then a third and important domain is active involvement of nurses, particularly in end-of-life care and decision-making. And then finally, the climate of mutual respect with the interdisciplinary team. And what you can see here is that a lot of these key domains have to do with uh, interactions uh, between uh, and amongst the interprofessional team. There was a uh, uh, ESICM ethics section uh, report uh, that came out uh, recently in published in Critical Care Medicine, uh, which made the case that interprofessional shared decision making is defined as a collaborative process amongst clinicians that allows for team involvement in important clinical decisions. ICU clinicians engaging in inter interprofessional shared decision making um, is really important to be a process. Uh, to assure the most appropriate and balanced decisions. Clinicians and hospitals can implement strategies to foster an ICU climate uh, that supports interprofessional shared decision making. Uh, this uh, group uh, made some recommendations uh, uh, around using this value team mnemonic to improve interprofessional communication and decision making. Uh, valuing statements from all members of the interprofessional team, acknowledging emotions that may come up in difficult uh, discussions and decisions, listening to each other, understanding the team's commitment, uh, shared commitment uh, to patients and high quality care, and then eliciting suggestions from all members of the team. In addition, uh, tying decisions to the best evidence, 
uh, elaborating on the patient's values, goals, and preferences during these discussions, addressing diverse opinions and seeking consensus, and then making the best decisions, weighing the options with the patient's goals. I'm going to talk a little bit about the results of two uh, randomized trials of interprofessional interventions uh, showing benefit with enhancing interprofessional communication. The first is a randomized trial that we did of communication facilitators to reduce family distress and intensity of end-of-life care in the ICU. In this trial, we enrolled critically ill patients with respiratory failure, and they were randomized to either intervention uh, or usual care. The intervention was a communication facilitator, a nurse or social worker who was specifically trained to facilitate communication between the ICU team and the family, as well as within the family and within the ICU team. They were trained to identify individual communication needs of the family members and then help the ICU team meet those needs and also to identify and address conflict uh, through mediation uh, to help with conflict resolution and improve communication. And that could be conflict between the family and the ICU team or within the family or even within the ICU team. We enrolled 268 family members of 168 patients. And what we looked at for outcomes were uh, three and six months. We looked at depression, anxiety, and symptoms of PTSD. We found there was a uh, trend towards improvement in depression at three months, and that was statistically significant at six months, which was our primary outcome. We had no change in anxiety and depression, I'm sorry, anxiety symptoms, but we did see uh, a trend towards reduction in symptoms of PTSD at six months as well. And then we also looked at the impact on length of stay and costs. There was a significant uh, decrease in ICU length of stay amongst decedents with this intervention. So the intervention of improving interprofessional communication uh, as well as communication with the family, uh, it did uh, result in shortening the length of stay for patients that died coming to decisions more quickly. Um, we also saw uh, costs, not surprisingly, were reduced in that group as well uh, and overall. Uh, since length of stay is a driver of costs. But then we also found amongst all patients that there was a reduction in the average daily costs. So even accounting for length of stay, there was still reduced costs with the intervention uh, uh, as communication and decision-making are improved. The second trial is a trial that was released uh, uh, in 2018 in New England Journal. Uh, this was a, a trial by uh, Doug White and his colleagues, uh, Stepped Wedge, a cluster randomized trial. And this intervention was a multi-component family support intervention that was delivered by the ICU team and led by a trained ICU nurse, what they called the partner nurse. This trial was uh, happening in five ICUs and included over 1,400 patients. This slide shows an outline of the design of this trial, uh, and it was fairly uh, complicated with a, a number of moving parts. Uh, the partner nurse had a first meeting with the family on day one, and then the trial outlined how the partner nurse would support the family around an interdisciplinary family meeting uh, on day two, uh, check-in during days three through six, a second family meeting around day seven where the partner nurse also supported the family and the team uh, and then continued check-ins after that. The outcomes of this trial uh, are shown here. They looked at uh, surrogate burden of psychological symptoms, which was uh, their primary outcome. There wasn't a difference there, but they did see a significant improvement in the family's assessment of the quality of communication as well as the family's assessment of how patient-centered the care was, which was the modified PPPC score. They also saw a reduction in uh, length of stay, uh, uh, length of ICU stay, as well as length of hospital stay uh, with this intervention. So similar results 
uh, that, that we saw with our trial as well. And then finally, I would like to just uh, spend a few minutes talking about lessons from regional variability. Um, I had an opportunity to spend a year in France recently, um, and uh, I think there are some interesting uh, ways to compare uh, interprofessional interactions between France and the United States. Uh, in France, uh, the default shared decision-making is closer to parentalism, where doctors take more uh, responsibility for decisions. The default in the U.S. is closer to autonomy, so that does change the way these decisions are made. Um, I found that in France, the team was more inclusive of the interprofessional team, particularly around difficult decisions about limiting life support. The Limitation Arrête Therapeutique was a structured meeting uh, that's actually been laid out by law where the team, the interprofessional team comes together uh, to talk about these issues and consensus on the team is actually required. I think in the US, we're not as inclusive of the ICU team often, but we are more inclusive of the patient's family often, incorporating the family more into decision-making and having more communication with the family. In France, there's been less advanced care planning and integration of palliative care into the intensive care unit, and that's happened more in the US, uh, also changing the way some of these decisions made. Um, and then in, the, in France, I think there's more focus on the patient's wishes, which I think is very helpful. In the US, we often focus more on the family's wishes, uh, which I think sometimes uh, can make these situations more complicated. In terms of directions for the future, interprofessional interventions offer uh, great potential to improve care, improving uh, patient and family outcomes, uh, and the ICU is inherently an interprofessional environment, but hierarchy sometimes interferes with our progress in advancing uh, interprofessional communication. I think that's something that we need to look at carefully. We need to have increased support for interprofessional research, education, and practice as a way for advancing interprofessional communication and collaboration in the intensive care unit, and ultimately improving patient care and patient and family outcomes. And with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention.